Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the exhibition Presence of Oaxaca in Asia, presented by the Ministry of Culture and the Arts of the Mexican state of Oaxaca and the, Me and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico, with the great support of the National Institute of Education and the Embassy of Mexico in Singapore. The exhibition Presencia de Oaxaca in, in Asia, Presence of Oaxaca in Asia, is a unique collection uh, that presents the artworks of world-renowned uh, Mexican Oaxacan artists like Rufino Tamayo, Francisco Toledo, as well as important uh, Oaxacan contemporary artists like Demian Flores, Amador Montes, Mauricio Cervantes, Rolando Rojas, Alejandro Santiago, among many others that you can see on this place here today. The exhibition will travel to Indonesia and Korea after its presentation here in Singapore. As part of the activities organized in the context of presence of Oaxaca in Singapore, we invited the renowned uh, Mexican art, uh, art critic uh, Santiago Espinosa de los Monteros to deliver lectures on the art of the state of Oaxaca and Mexican contemporary art, respectively. Mr. Santiago Espinosa de los Monteros has a degree in journalism from the Universidad Iberoamericana and has held the position of National Coordinator of Visual Arts at the National Institute of Fine Arts of Mexico, Cultural Counselor in the Embassies of Mexico to Venezuela and Canada, and among many others. He has written extensively on Mexican art in newspapers and specialized journals in Mexico, Venezuela, and Colombia, including Art Vance, where he was part of the editorial board, and Art Nexus. He is the author of Roger Van Hunt, uh, von Hunten, The Innocent Precision of Chaos, and has co-authored at least a dozen books on Mexican contemporary art, in, particularly, in particular retrospectives on the artworks of Arturo Rivera, Anastasia Gri, Ricardo Masal, Joy Laville, among others. He has also extensive experience as curator, as well as uh, of exhibition featuring the artworks of Roger uh, von Gunten, Joy Laville, Luis Soto, Nina Menocal, and a retrospective of Oaxacan art. The second lecture of Mr. Santiago will take place on the 25th of October at 10.30 here at the NIE Gallery. After this lecture, we invite you to take a tour of the exhibition and enjoy the reception that will follow. With further ado, let's welcome Mr. Santiago Espinosa de los Monteros. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. I want. Uh, I feel very, very honored uh, to the presence because of the presence of a uh, Mexican ambassador, Rogelio Granguillon, and his wife Elena. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's an honor for us to have you here. Uh, thank you also uh, to Beatriz Nava. All the work she's been doing. A lot of work behind this that uh, sometimes it's not easy to find out, but. Uh, in this case, uh, it's very clear that uh, all the things that are happening here have a lot of things to do before, and uh, Beatriz Nava has been in charge of that. Thank you for that, Beatriz. Uh, also, uh, I want to say thank you to Xing Shorleng. I said, okay, your name? Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, he's not here, but uh, in Oaxaca there is uh, the the person in charge of the cultural matters in Oaxaca, which is uh, Emilio de Leo. Uh, he's a person behind this exhibition in the state of Oaxaca in Mexico. So uh, from here to Oaxaca, I say hello to him. He will never know it, but hello. <laughs> uh, it's a, I, I felt very, very honored to be invited to this exhibition because uh, for many years I've been very related to the theme of Oaxaca. Oaxaca is a very uh, ritual place in Mexico, it's a state in, in the south uh, orient of Mexico. And uh, for many years, because of many reasons, has been a, a state that has uh, given birth to very important art producers. Uh, Oaxaca is also a very, very powerful place uh, in, in, uh, in matters of what you see in Oaxaca. There is a lot of a uh, presence of uh, the pre-Hispanic culture, of course, a lot of uh, churches. Uh, the Dominicans, uh, uh, priests, were in Oaxaca. 
And as you very well know, the Dominicans are very uh, rich in what they do, are not, for example, like the Franciscans, which are very uh, soft and very superb in the, in the architecture and the, the things, and also the, the, the clothes they wear, they are very, very uh, simple. Not Dominicans, Dominicans are very rich, and the, the way they think also is reflected in the, the way they decorate the churches and they put the altars and how they put a Christ or whatever. And uh, I am very, very sure that uh, this very uh, powerful visual influential to the Mexican creators has been inside in, in front of the things they do. In some cases, uh, it's not only that they are going to represent the, the things as they see them in Oaxaca, because it's, this, is not, this, this film is not going about uh, what are you going to uh, imitate or not? Is what are you seeing, and from that, a nun. The, the idea is how to recreate that things that you are looking at. That's why Oaxaca gave birth uh, to many, many, many important uh, painters. Uh, for example, Rufino Tamayo and uh, Rodolfo Morales. From uh, we are going to talk a little bit about them. Uh, we're going to see uh, some images uh, in this, uh, in this uh, screen of the things that you already have in this gallery. So uh, uh, please, I want you to forgive me because uh, the images are uh, not in a high quality, but they are only pretend to represent what uh, you can see in, 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 the, in the real person in, this, in these walls. Uh, this exhibition... It's uh, very interesting because he's opened it uh, by a very, very young, uh, young painter, which is uh, Victor Hugo Reyes Vázquez. This is the last generation of painters. And I'm going to talk about the painters in the order of the paintings that we have in the walls. The reason is as uh, simple that uh, to keep an order and to keep a, a, a way to look, but uh, it doesn't pretend anymore to be a uh, generation speaking. Of course, we will go finding it well, well not speaking. Uh, this, uh, this guy, Victor Hugo Reyes, is maybe the last generation of painters. And uh, they are working a lot with uh, graphic art, with uh, computers, and using these uh, different LEDs of, uh, of, uh, of uh, images. So you can find in this, in this part the acrylic, which also, this is also a very, very contemporary uh, material that uh, they are using for to express themselves. As you can see, these are very, very silent paintings. Are very, uh, they do not pretend to tell you any story. They only pretend to put you in front of a different ways of find colors and find uh, different uh, ledges. And so this, this painting, which is also discreet in the sizes, as you can see it in the, it's in the first uh, in the first part of this wall, they are very, very small paintings. It's not this painting very, very uh, uh, protagonic. And this is a very, very simple way to, to go. Uh, now, we have here <clears throat> Rufino Tamayo. These two artworks are from him, this, the, the first one and the second one. And uh, in this case, uh, this, this artwork belongs to a very interesting series that Tamayo did uh, maybe in the 80s or 90s, which was about the family. And because he was doing a lot of schedules, a lot of sketches, I'm sorry, about this, uh, these big paintings, he began to take away some uh, personages of, the, of the, the paintings. And in this case, this, this artwork is uh, one of those uh, personages belonging to the very big series of the family. Uh, you can see, for example, when you go closer to this painting, you can see, for example, that uh, these red colors are in serigraphy. Most of the, of the black paintings around are made in, in lithography, which is in the stones. And most of the, the other colors are doing as an engraving. And so these, uh, these paintings have the three techniques of uh, the, the engraving. That's why it's called it mixographias. The mixographies uh, are very, very well valued because uh, Tamayo 
was a, was a very, very powerful author in, the, in that terms, and that he wanted that each one of his, uh, of his uh, artworks had a different uh, presence. It doesn't matter that the theme was the same one. Uh, you can find, for example, the, the, this piece in another collection, and for example, the tongue is not red, and the hand is not red, maybe it's green, because he decided to do it that way. It doesn't matter that it is the same personage. Uh, in this one, for example, these hands, that are the Tamayo's hands, uh, he's doing a more simple artwork in terms of technique. This is only a serigraphy, which is a very, a very nice piece. And this belongs to a very experimental uh, uh, stage of Tamayo that was a very, very powerful author. Then the next one is uh, Rodolfo Nieto. And uh, my personal sensation when I see this uh, artwork is that uh, he never finished it. This, uh, Rodolfo Nieto was more uh, obsessive in his uh, paintings, he, in his drawings. In his day, he made a lot of animals, uh, fantastic animals, that, uh, of course, they have nothing to do with the, with the reality, uh, animals that he invented, but some of them are called a giraffe or an elephant, whatever, but you never see a giraffe or an elephant. <laughs> this, this is his zoography. And uh, in this case, it's very interesting because it's like looking the process of the, the, the way that uh, Rodolfo Nieto was going in front the, the themes. I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting artwork because uh, we always see in the museums and in the galleries the very finished works, the works that the author only accepts to be presented to the public. And in this case, I insist, this is my personal perception, in this case, it's a work in progress. It's a, as if you take this painting away from the studio of Rodolfo Nieto while he is doing it, and take it away before he finishes. And I think it's very, very interesting. And the other one is Rodolfo Morales, uh, full of Rodolfos in, in Mexico. Uh, Rodolfo Morales, he was creating a lot of uh, iconography about the angels, about the people of Oaxaca, about the customs, about the flowers. And he was a very um, uh, well-known painter because of the magic of his paintings. For example, you will see a, a cathedral, a garden, and over the cathedral and the garden, people walking in the skies, a little bit like Chagall. He had, uh, he had a point of Chagall in, in his artworks. And uh, after that, was like a, like a kind of a, this magical iconography. In this point, with Rufino Tamayo, Rodolfo Nieto, and Rodolfo Morales, we are seeing three of the most uh, old painters that are the basis of the rest of the art in Oaxaca. Uh, maybe they began doing these incredible artworks, these very, very uh, interesting things for the eyes of the people in Mexico City, in Monterrey, in Guadalajara, that were the centers of production of most of the, the things of art. And uh, they begin going through this new uh, way of seeing, this new way of telling stories that nobody was listening to. That's why, that's why it's very important to, to see these three authors in first point, because they began also opening uh, a, a new way of looking at the painting in Mexico, to, to look at the visual arts in Mexico. They are one of the, one of the, the three most important authors. Uh, we, we cannot separate, fortunately and unfortunately, <laughs> both terms, we cannot separate the idea of Oaxaca with the idea of art market in Mexico. Because they began doing these very important things and the market began to buy them a lot. In many cases, it was a very, very good thing that was happening. But in, in other cases, it was terrible because painters began to do things that the market wanted to buy. And they stopped doing the things that really were growing inside them and doing them in the, in the paintings. And then Rodolfo Morales, uh, Nieto, and Tamayo were very powerful in that sense because they did what they did. They were working the things they wanted to work, but they were not concerned about the market. 
if the market was buying, okay. But if it doesn't buy, that's your problem, not mine. I want to do what I want to do, and if you want it, that's the way it is. Which is very, very important. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the next one, which is uh, Francisco Toledo work, uh, he's maybe one of the most important persons living right now in Mexico. He's around, he's 70 something, 73, 75 years old. And he's still a very, very powerful and patrono of, of Oaxaca. And for many years, he has been also helping a lot the city of Oaxaca doing the IAGO, which means uh, uh, Graphic uh, Instituto de Artes Gráficas de Oaxaca, Graphic Art Institute from Oaxaca. And there is a, a huge collection of graphic arts from all the world. In that place, you can find uh, Topor, you can find Toulouse Lautrec, you can find Goya, you can find Picasso, because for many years, he has been changing his own artworks with galleries and collectors to have this... Uh, very important uh, artworks in the, in the IAGO, in the Graphic Arts Institute. It's very interesting to have this, uh, this artwork here from Toledo. Because Toledo began as a very simple drawer, doing very, very erotic things, for example, and uh, also at the same time very fantastic things, like uh, butterflies or uh, uh, scorpions with, with wings, or uh, frogs uh, having sex uh, with a monkey. I mean, this very, very crazy, this crazy world. And uh, he's been, cyclically, he's been renewing himself. As uh, maybe uh, uh, most of you are students uh, of uh, visual arts, and if you look at the story of many painters, you can find out that it's not usual that they change the way they express themselves. Most of the most important uh, uh, visual artists in the world, they are, they are constantly breaking what they did in the past. Uh, maybe one of the most important examples is Picasso. Uh, Goya did it. Uh, Rothko did it. Uh, Pollock, Jackson Pollock did it also. And if you see, suddenly, if you can see all the picture, all the full picture of the, the work they did, you can see that cyclically, maybe it's 15, 20 years, they begin to break with all the things they began to do in the past and go through the new, uh, the new expressions. That's very risky. It's very risky because maybe they can fail. But... They didn't, of course, now, now, with, the, now with the time and we, when, when we see them in a distance. Now we find out that they did what they have to do and it's very important, the work we have now in front of us. But in that point, it was very risky and uh, they did a very, very successful artworks. Toledo is one of those persons. Toledo is one of the authors that he has been breaking with the, his own works for many years and cyclically, it's 15, 20 years, suddenly you see something very different, and somebody says, hey, look at this Toledo. Toledo? Yes, it's Toledo. Really? Yes. And it's a very, very diff different artwork that uh, you were not expected to, to see from his hand. And uh, in this case, for example, he's using a collage, and he's putting this uh, seat. Somebody knows what kind of uh, tree belongs these seeds? Because we were, we were asking a lot, uh, uh, Beatriz Navalny, what seeds are these, from what tree they belong to? Do you know? And jacaranda. Is it, is it jacaranda? Well, maybe we can. I have a suggestion. Maybe we can take one of the paintings and put it in the land, let's see how it, how it grows. <laughs> but uh, uh, the main point is that uh, he goes through uh, a new way of expressions, making collages and making a lot of, uh, of uh, works that have a very, very uh, strong relation with the things he's living around. For example, he uses a lot uh, small pieces of wood he finds in the street, or he uses uh, uh, pieces of stones that he cuts 
and he incorporates it to the, to the paintings. I think that's one of the very, very important, important things. Talking about the market, here we have uh, one of the most uh, important artists. He's maybe around his 50, 50 somethings, which is Sergio Hernandez. Sergio, uh, in, in this uh, very joyful uh, painting, Sergio was uh, one of the authors after, after Toledo that began to do in, uh, this, uh, to create these new aesthetics. Uh, with Sergio happened a terrible, terrible thing. He began to do uh, wonderful artworks, and uh, with the time, he began to sell a lot, and sell, and sell, and sell, and sell. And suddenly the people was, uh, for example, once I listened to a conversation in a, in a, in a meeting, that said, uh, somebody was telling to the other person, yes, I want to uh, go to Oaxaca very, very soon because uh, I need a Sergio Hernandez. I mean, it wasn't, I want a Sergio Hernandez, I think Sergio Hernandez is important enough. No, I need a Sergio Hernandez. That, that means that was a matter of market only. And uh, Sergio Hernandez was a, a little bit victim of that, uh, of that uh, situation. And so he began to sell a lot and suddenly he began to produce more uh, very simple things and stopped doing the things that did that Sergio Hernandez was the important author we all know he was. But anyhow, you can't uh, explain the, the Oaxaca environment of visual artists without speaking about Sergio, Sergio Hernandez. Now, this is Maximino Javier, which is the next one. And it's a, a very joyful painting with these very, very simple drawings. And uh, Maximino Javier was, uh, well, is, because he is alive. Maximino Javier is maybe one of the persons that has given more uh, sensation of magic to the idea of the paintings of Oaxaca. It's because uh, you can see all the musicians, you can see cows flying, you can see uh, uh, people in the party, in the, in, the, in the bottom here, people joining, uh, a woman uh, naked, this uh, strange animal, and all the people over this animal. And this, this uh, many people make uh, makes, uh, jokes about uh, the paintings of uh, Maximino Javier, and they say that the only way that you can understand the paintings of Maximino or to do them is drinking a lot of mezcal. Mezcal is a very powerful drink in, in Oaxaca. And uh, he's, uh, the, the way they say is, the only way you can do it is drunk, <laughs> which is not, of course. But, uh, but uh, Maximino has been also doing a lot of work very near uh, to, the, to this uh, magic uh, uh, idea of, of Oaxaca. Now here we have another very, very important art piece, which is uh, from Daniel Leiva. No, I'm sorry, it's not, uh, it's Ruben Leiva, not Daniel. Uh, this is a strange uh, art piece of, uh, of Ruben, because he has been always working more representative things. And in this case, this painting in black and white, uh, you can find out that he is very near, for example, all the South School, in, in America. When I say America, I'm not talking about US. America is all the continent. It's all the, and it's US is the United States of America, but America, when I say America, I'm talking about Brazil, Uruguay, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, all the continent. And uh, this, uh, this piece of art, which is very interesting, it's very near to the works of uh, Torres Garcia in Uruguay, and Gurbich, also his pupil. It's very interesting because the way he composes, very straight, very, very square, very, uh, uh, like, very, um, uh, I mean, it's not, it's, not an, it's not an organic painting, it's a very, very geometrical painting. It's a way that uh, the, the South School in, in America were doing that in the 30s. And I think this is a very, very interesting artwork from, uh, from uh, Ruben Leiva, because it's one of the examples that, uh, that he was, in one point of his career, breaking again 
his old works and doing new, new things with the rescue and uh, with, the, with all the things that that means. Uh, you can find also a very narrative way there. You can find also birds, houses, streets, whatever. But the idea is only to represent them, not to tell you a story about uh, these, uh, these cities. The next one is uh, Alejandro Santiago. Alejandro Santiago, you, you fortunately, he passed away three months ago. He was uh, in his 51 years old. And he was a very, very important uh, painter. He uh, was doing a lot of things with new uh, creators. For example, he had a place called uh, La Calera, which was an old factory, and he was doing a lot of work with very, very young people. He had a place that's called La Telaraña. How do you call it? Telaraña? The, the, um, the net of... Uh, The, the spider net, that, that was the name of the spider net. And uh, there was a place only for sculpture of, uh, of uh, people from, uh, from otherwise, from Oaxaca or from otherwise. And uh, he was doing a, a lot of work. And he did a very, very important project in Oaxaca that called it 2,501 migrants. He belongs to a very small town in Oaxaca. And from that town, only in one year, 2,501 persons went to work to the United States. It's very common that people from Oaxaca and Puebla and Zacatecas go to the other side, go to the to United States of America to find a better opportunities of work. And from his town, all these people went away. And suddenly his town was out of people, was out of uh, his friends was out of uh, uh, mostly, mostly men's, and, uh, and uh, suddenly he began to feel this absence of, of these people. And what, we did, what he did was uh, to begin doing sculptures of these people. Of not, they were not portraits, they were only representations. And he did 2,501 sculptures this size, on clay with the ovens and uh, you can imagine this amount of sculptures that was huge that was incredible <clears throat> and that exhibition was traveling a lot in, in Mexico and in US it was a very very powerful exhibition not only because of the artworks that were very very powerful in, in themselves also because of the meaning of those artworks that were representing the people that was going out of his uh, very, very small town. There were uh, childs, there were women, there were elder people, there was uh, young people, workers, uh, his neighbor, his uh, friend, uh, his pupils, and all of them were represented there because that was the people that was not anymore in his town. As he was missing them, he opted to recreate them. That was a very, very important artwork. And, um, from this, from this uh, position, I want to send a hello to Alejandro Santiago, wherever he is. I don't know where he is now, but uh, I wish him the best in his new life, in his new trip. This is the new generation. This is this, is this painting and this other one, well, photographs, are from uh, Guillermo Olguín. Guillermo Olguín now represents this new generation of people that is looking Oaxaca, that they live in Oaxaca, they have this uh, uh, eye very well informed about the, the things that happen in Oaxaca, but he doesn't only stay in, the, in one point to recreate this magical thing, also he intervenes, he, he makes up huge paintings, very big ones, and uh, also intervenes, for example, in this case, two photographs. As you can see, this, all, all these goats in the, in the, in the trying to go inside the, the door, these goats here, they are in the, the, there's a festivity, a very important festivity in Oaxaca that they kill thousands of goats because they, uh, they do uh, meat and they do uh, barbacoa and they do a lot of things. And it's a very, very uh, important day. And he mixes this 
this is a very landed and very meat uh, photograph with a fish that has nothing to do with, with the rest of the... And he's not trying to create a story. He's not trying to tell us a story. He's only proposing lo what mentally was immediately for him to do. Most of the, of the, of the photographs in, in, with the ones uh, Guillermo Leguin has been working are from the Alberto Ibáñez photographer, which is a very important photographer. And uh, I'm not sure in this case they are both from Alberto Ibáñez, but they are very similar to him, to him works. And uh, in this case, it's very, very important to find out how he goes over of a photograph that has itself his own language. The photographs, for example, in this case, the tree. Well, it's the landscape, the tree, the sky, everything so clear, so, so cool, so nice, so perfect. But he goes over with this kind of a, of a camarón, como se dice? And this kind of a shrimp over, over the tree, a giant shrimp, for example, and intervening, putting, for example, this, uh, these papers here. In both cases, he's using, I should like to know what's the meaning about. In these cases, he uses the, the bills of the Federal Company of Electricity. Here we, you, we have another one. Let me see if I can do. Here, CFE, that means Comisión Federal de Electricidad, Federal Commission of Electricity. And uh, here you can see the, the, the wind, um, the, the eolic uh, engineering here, this part. The photo is terrible. These are the bulbs over here. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he's, he's always mixing mixing this uh, a fantastic uh, world of the, of the fishes and of the goats with a very rude reality in the one you have to pay the electricity, you have to pay taxes, you have to buy your food, you have to drive your car. I mean, he's mixing, it's like putting in land the, the, the idea of, the, of the, this uh, magical Oaxaca which is, of course, not anymore the magical Oaxaca. It's a very real place to live. Now here we have uh, Raúl Herrera. Raúl Herrera is a very, very uh, strange example. <clears throat> he is now maybe around his 70s, and he's been doing a lot of uh, very oriental work. He had a teacher from Japan many years ago, and that's why he learned it perfectly how to, to paint with these, uh, with these brushes, uh, very, very, very specialized for the, for the oriental painting. And he's been doing that work for many, many years. And he lives in Oaxaca, and he's there, and he's also a very important teacher of a public in Oaxaca because he has a very important uh, way to approach the paintings. I mean, it's not, all, it's not only to have your paper in front of you, take uh, the colors and begin to do things there. He prepares a lot, his body, his movements, his, uh, his mind. He prepares a lot to begin doing his artworks. Uh, sometimes he begins uh, practicing his, his hands and he begins to do a lot of exercise before painting for to have the best uh, improvement to the, to, the, to the paper or to the canvas once he goes through. And so when you see him painting, it's like a kind of a dance. It's like a kind of a, a, a way that he does in a very, very, uh, in, like in a meditation moment. He's a very, very interesting painter. And he belongs to a very strange generation in Mexico that it's called Ruptura. Ruptura is confirmed uh, with painters like uh, Vicente Rojo, Alberto Gironella, Manuel Felgueres, José Luis Cuevas, which uh, are very different between them. As a generation, maybe they are a generation because they have all, all the, the same age. Are, uh, but uh, when you see the paintings from all of them, they are very, very separated one, to, one from the others. And he was belonging to this generation. And in one point of his life, he said, stop. 
not anymore, and he took away to do some other things, and he separated physically, and in his hard works, he separated from all the generation. Uh, maybe with the years, <clears throat> we will have to read the work of Raúl Herrera as a person that is always trying to find things. Uh, maybe uh, it's not important if he is really finding them. The important thing is the way to try to find them. The important thing is not to arrive to the place. The important thing is the way you take to that place. The things that go happening to you during the way, not if you arrive or not. And I think the case of Raul Herrera is one of these important cases of people that is always trying to find something. It doesn't matter if he is successful in his research. The important thing is the, the things that are happening to him and to his paintings during this uh, trajectory, during this, uh, during this way. Now this is a, a, another painter. He is uh, from Mexico City. And he decided to go to live to Oaxaca maybe about uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And he's uh, picking up a lot of the, the influence of the pre-Hispanic uh, frisos. As you can see, uh, here are uh, many of the, the figures that you can find also in the Paramites and in, the, in many of the, the ancient places of the, of the Mayans or the Zapotecos or the Aztecs. And the idea of presenting them also in this position is, is very important because it's like, uh, it's like uh, try, trying to recover the idea of the frisos that all of them tell stories. In this case, of course, he's not trying to tell any story, but uh, this, this uh, painting belongs to a series that he did with, uh, with uh, a mosaicos, como se llama? The ties from the houses that uh, are used for the floors, I think, ambassador. From the, from the floor, and it's very, very interesting that you can find also the goats that you can find in the photographs of uh, Guillermo Holguín. <clears throat> Once again, it begins to appear. The environment of Oaxaca begins to appear constantly in the works of these, of these, uh, of these people. Now we have this uh, very strange painting. Uh, I really don't like it. <laughs> I have to say the truth. <laughs> I have to say the truth before you discover I was lying. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think it's a very decorative painting, but it's also part of the things that are happening in Oaxaca, part of the, 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 the market is trying to put these paintings in many uh, uh, collections and galleries, but it's part of the things that sometimes, in my very, very personal opinion, I respect a lot this painter, as I respect a lot of the uh, the painters that are here. But uh, in, in this case, I find it's a very easy way to try to shock out uh, the, the, the viewer, uh, finding out uh, uh, strange uh, personages or things that reminds us a lot of uh, authors. Uh, here is uh, Dalí, here is uh, Roberto Mata, here is uh, also Maestro Toledo, uh, there's a lot of authors except the one that is painting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really don't like him. Sorry. Well, next. Uh, I think it's a, 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 the, the very orthodox uh, painting is always, always alive. Maybe you as a, as a people that is concerned about the, the contemporary art. Maybe you have been listening for many years. The painting is dead. Because it's one of the things that most of the people that works with the very, very contemporary or, or conceptual art or actual art, they do uh, like, like a statement for to say, no, the important things that are happening here are these objects, these uh, uh, curatorial proposals, but not anymore the painting. The painting, they, they see it as a very simple way to express. But if you see the story of the art, you will always find paintings, always. It doesn't matter that it's a performance era or it's a, the, the, 
electronics era or is the photography era. It doesn't matter how epoch of, of, the, of the art you are looking at. There will always be paintings. There are, sometimes are good ones or bad ones, but anyhow, there is a, 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 always the presence of the painting. And in this case, it's, it's very interesting that uh, this author does, ma makes this very, very simple artwork with a tree and a landscape because it represents also this part of Oaxaca that is a very, very quiet Oaxaca, but at the same time is very powerful. All, all this grass that you can see now in the, in, the, in the bottom of a tree, of course, it means it's winter or something like that because it's very dry. Once the rains begin to fall down, all this grass goes green and the landscape is totally different. It's, I mean, I'm not saying nothing new, of course, but uh, it's very interesting that he takes this landscape as it is without putting and taking away anything and just represent what he is looking at. I, th I think it's very, very, very important. Now, here, here we have a, an Isifur Urbieta. Uh, if I find uh, this uh, painting in a museum in Austria, I, I won't feel strange, but when I see this in Oaxaca, I feel queer, curious about uh, what is going on. As you can see, this painting has been, the, the canvas is part of a very decorated uh, thing of a, maybe a seat or a cortin in a house. And he uses that as a background for to represent these very decorative things in, uh, in Oaxaca. Of course, this, uh, this thing has nothing to do with the, with the Oaxacan uh, way of expressing the decorations. I mean this part of the painting, of course. All these parts. All this area here. It's, a, it's very interesting. And these kind of birds are not very typical uh, in Oaxaca. Maybe you can find them in some uh, lagoons or in some uh, small lakes around. But they are not very, very typical in Oaxaca. The important thing in this case is that these kind of authors live in Oaxaca and they are producing there. And so you can find out that Oaxaca is also a place that welcomes a lot of people doing, doing uh, his artworks. Now we have a, a more, uh, very more contemporary, more contemporary artwork. Uh, Nisefor Urbieta is related to the, to the very old painter, we said Jesus Urbieta, that did a lot of work in, in maybe 60s or 70s, and he is now doing a very contemporary artwork. If you can see, it uh, has two, it's dated two times. This uh, here says 2012, and here says 2010. I mean, this means that his painting was maybe, he began it in 2010 and finished it two years later. And to leave it, to leave those two days, two dates in the painting is a kind of a statement to, to, try, to, to try to show the people all the period that, uh, that, that uh, was between one date and another. I think it's very important because all of the painters only do the, put their last uh, date that when they finish the paintings. And uh, that's it. And he did not. He did. He he chose it to do these uh, two parts. Of course, it's a painting that he could do maybe in, in not in two years, but maybe the painting was resting in, in one part of his studio. Now here you can see uh, Jose Luis Garcia, which is a very interesting uh, painter also. That is not. Uh, He's trying to find also these uh, kind of uh, sensations with colors and shadows. This reminds us a lot. Uh, this, uh, in the markets in Oaxaca, they use a lot of uh, plastics, for example, or uh, very small uh, linens or things for, to cover from the sun. And this is one of these, uh, these paintings of that, uh, that uh, sensation to be in the markets. And here we have a very, very important one. Uh, this is Ricardo Pinto. He is one of the authors uh, that uh, 
since he was very, very young, he was breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking the things that he was doing. He began to do series of things. He stopped doing that and he began to do another thing and he stopped it and he began to do another thing and stopped it. This coming and going from one uh, part to the other, that has been making him a very, very uh, rigid author in terms of techniques. If you go near the, this painting later when you have time, try to see the the way he paints and the way he uh, spreads the colors in the, in the linen. And it's very interesting how he, con he controls all the, this structure of this very lined, like bricks, all this lined, lined painting. He's uh, very related to a uh, generation. He's not from Oaxaca, he was born in Guadalajara. And he's very related to a generation that has been doing a lot of research in, in visual arts, not only in Guadalajara, also in Oaxaca. In Guadalajara, he belongs to a generation of uh, Gonzalo Lebrija and uh, uh, Mendes Blake, which are uh, authors that are from his same generation. And each one is doing things in a very separate ways, but with the same uh, impulse of the, of the research. And now, here is uh, Alejandro Villegas work which is, um, in my opinion, is very decorative. It's very nice. It is. It's a very correct painting. It is. Um, but it, it leaves me a little bit uh, empty. It's only, it's only what you see. There's no more story behind. There's nothing behind. It's like a very narrative, uh, narrative painting. It's, it's not... Uh, it's not it's not as difficult for me to read this painting as for me is to read this one. But in this case, it's like very obvious uh, all the things that are happening. It's try, trying to reconstruct the, the spaces of Oaxaca with the clothes uh, drying in the sun, people in bicycles, uh, the birds. Uh, it's like a very, very simple story. And I think, uh, as I was saying, that it is a very, very decorative work. She has better things, I assure you. This one is a very interesting painting. Uh, Emilia Sandoval, <clears throat> if you can go uh, near the, 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 the paint, you will find out that she was... Uh, these are needles that she goes one by one doing all the, all the, the seeds. And that these are plastic... Uh, these are plastic bubbles that she takes out from the, from the market uh, bolsas, how do you say bolsas? The plastic bags. And then she cuts it out because she's doing a lot of comments of the environment, about the contamination, about the pollution. And she, she is, that's why this is full of color and the rest of the nature is only black and white because nature, in her opinion, is dying and is suffering because of the presence of the, the plastic and all the pollution. She's a very uh, uh, compromised artist with the environment, and she's doing a lot of very, very important things as a group, and she's leading uh, many, many places that, uh, that uh, goes through the, 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 the environment uh, keeping. Here we go again with uh, Luis Zarate, a very, very strange painting of Luis Zarate. Very strange. Uh, I have to confess that uh, when I saw this painting my first time, I didn't believe it was from Luis Zarate because it's a very good one. And uh, when, I, when I saw this, this figure that is with his feet like this, like, like, uh, like the Greek, uh, like the... Like the Egyptian figures, and the, it was very, very interesting, and the way he draws it's a very, very interesting. Look at the presence, once again, of the fish. The fishes are very important for the, the Oaxacan culture. And this, uh, this painting from Luis Arate, I feel, is a very experimental artwork. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, painting from Luis Arate. I really don't know why he does not do this anymore. He's doing some very, very strange things. But but anyway, now here we go with a very contemporary artist. He's uh, it's a very, very 
a powerful thing. As you can see, for example, all these, these uh, stars, it, it means a lot of uh, the punks in, in Oaxaca. There is a very important movement of punks in Oaxaca, believe it or not. That also reminds us the Statue of the Liberty and at the same time, the Aztecs with, with the feathers in, in their heads, which is very, very interesting. Here you have the birds of Oaxaca and this broken, uh, here, let me, let me make it bigger because it's a, uh, and this, this broken toy here with the bones, well, we don't have two bones here. We only have one, but anyway, he, he decided we have two bones, okay? And uh, it's very interesting the way he makes all the painting. It's not, uh, uh, it's not an easy painting. It's a, a painting that is very typical in his generation, very full of things, very full of, uh, of color, very full of the iconography of the skeleton, uh, because it's very present also in the pre-Hispanic artworks. And the, the idea of these paintings, once again, goes back to in terms that if you like it, it's very good. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. This is what I do, and this is what I, what I present, which is very important. I, f I feel that it's a very important statement in this case. It's incredible to find out in Oaxaca a lot of people doing these artworks right now because they come from a very important generation that uh, began in 206, 2006, that I'm going to, to speak uh, about them in a while. Here's a detail of this uh, skeleton. And this uh, plastic thing, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's a statement to do it. Valerie Campos, which is this painting over here, Valerie Campos makes a lot of, uh, I try to do a, uh, okay, well, horrible photos, I'm sorry. But uh, maybe you remember the, the old magazine, The New Yorker, where uh, Mr. Norman Rockwell was the painter of the front pages always. And you can find here a lot of paintings very relative to the normal rock. These are, for example, uh, los guajolotes, los, uh, the, the, los pavos, ¿cómo se dice pavos? Uh, the turkeys, the turkeys, the Mexican turkeys that we have a lot of them, and they're very common in the very small towns, and uh, the mole come from there. Now, if you're have, having mole, you will find out what the guajolotes are for. And uh, here, all these figures, for example, they belong a lot about all these uh, magazines from U.S. that come from the New Yorker, especially, as I said, from the Norman Rockwell uh, paintings, which was a very, very important painter. And also here is a very strange uh, situation about the, the, the oriental uh, buildings. Here again, this uh, very North American uh, girl with a very occidental way of seeing. Here we, we are again in front of a very oriental uh, situation. And the, this strange bird here, it's like a kind of a buitre, como se dice buitre in English? Um, this, um, como? Kraus cuervo, no más bien? Vulture. Which is, uh, the, the, has the main presence of all the of all the painting. Now with a small views of the gallery. Without you being here, it was this way. Okay, here is the other the other uh, area that uh, is in the next gallery. Maybe you have the opportunity to see it. <clears throat> this is Yvonne Kennedy. Yvonne Kennedy is a, a, a woman from the uh, United States and she has been working a lot for many, many years in, in Oaxaca and she's also, not, she's not only a painter, uh, gracias, she's not only a painter, she is a 
cooker. She makes a lot of, uh, he's a chef. He's a chef, and uh, she works a lot with the many very important communities in, in Oaxaca. Now you can see here again the, the Oaxaca's items. For example, all this part in the back are what we call petates. It's uh, palms uh, in the crossing uh, needle it by, by uh, for t you, you, you can use them in the floor, you can use them as a cortines, and uh, it's very, very important presence of this material in the, in, the, in the life of Oaxaca. I'm not very, very interested in what happens in this painting, but I am very interested in why this author is using this support to do his painting. Here, for example, we have a, a, a Mexican Virgin of Guadalupe, but as Beatriz Nava makes me notice, she's in a loto flower. Of course, the, the Mexican version of Guadalupe, she's not in a loto flower. She's in, a, in a, another thing, like a, a half moon, and has angels. And this is engraving of papers. And here again, you can find all the information. Look at this part here. Once again, the new generations doing uh, very, very simple things, but they are people that are learning a lot. And this is Heriberto Kessner. Did you recognize the guy here? Do you recognize him? Oops, no, 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 this guy. <laughs> it's Richard Nixon. It's Richard Nixon, former president of the U.S., and he's the guy that uh, he was uh, very well known because he was fired during the Watergate case, and he had to resign his presidency. And now, in this case, Heriberto Kessner makes a joke about him, about this president, in this uh, very uncomfortable situation for him. Uh, Heriberto Kessner has been a very, very important painter because not, not only because he has a very good hand as a painter and he's a, he's a very, technically he's a very, very important one, also because he creates very, very strange situations, sometimes absurd, sometimes very rich, sometimes uh, uh, very uh, electionable. But in this case, this absurd thing with, uh, with this uh, uh, cartoon personages and the mapaches and things, in this very kinky situation with Nixon dressed as a woman and uh, with a, a hitting a lady here, or maybe it's not a lady, we don't know. But here, these this kind of situations are very typical in the works of Roberto Kessnel. Kessnel, for many years, was the boyfriend of Valerie Campos, the girl of the large painting here. And he's also from Mexico City, and he decided to go to live in Oaxaca, uh, uh, many years ago, maybe about uh, eight or ten years ago, he lives in Oaxaca, and he's producing there all his artworks. Again, we have here the, 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 the fightings, for example, the, the lucha libre. You, you are aware about fightings, the, the, the luchadores? Wrestling. You know? The wrestling, that's right. All these people with the masks and the they are very, very popular in Mexico, and uh, they appear very often in the paintings of, uh, of uh, the, 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 paint, the, the painters of Oaxaca. And here we have this person with uh, the head cover. This comes in, in the 90, uh, 94 appeared in the Chiapas State uh, uh, guerrilla movement that calls uh, Zapatismo. And uh, the person in charge in that movement was the subcomandante Marcos. The, the, uh, Marcos, like a, like a commander, he had his face covered. And uh, that made a kind of an icon of the resistance and the people that was uh, trying to fight 
against the state because of many reasons, and that they began to go through the state board covering their heads for to protect their identity. That is very related to the whistlers that protect also their faces, because not only because they have to go through the to the enemy in that in that case uh, to fight, also because they want to protect their identity. When a fighter, when a wrestler takes away the mask of the opponent, is the way he wins. Well, we have simple things everywhere. And look again, the petate. This uh, this is a painting from Morello Celis. That is one of the the young generation artists. And this is what we can find in the floor and in the walls of many, many houses in Oaxaca. And this is Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez is uh, the main hero in Oaxaca. He was a president in Mexico. He had a, a, a key importance in the history of Mexico with the laws of reforma, the reformation laws. And he's one of the very, very important painters there. But his figure has been use it for a lot of, a lot of things. It's a, like a symbol of the officialism. So when he uses this uh, Benito Juarez in the petate, and he puts him with two faces, with two heads, it's like uh, trying to make a joke with him, try to, make a, uh, try to make him more to the earth, and erase all the values as a hero that he has. This so is another very, very young painter. And this very complicated art piece, full of, uh, of graffitis, everywhere with a mirror, the car, the imagine, uh, pending, lost in the world, perdido en el mundo. It says lost in the world. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of things there that are very common. If you can walk through the streets in Oaxaca. Many of them have graffitis, and the graffitis have graffitis over the graffitis that uh, the gang from this uh, block was fighting again against the gang of this one, this other block of this neighborhood, and they begin to do paintings over the paintings, over the paintings, over the paintings, and each time you can, you can find a lot of uh, uh, paintings, one over the other ones, and they scratch it because the gangs want to have always the last presence in those walls. This uh, uh, drawing, which is a very precise drawing, it tells a lot of very simple stories, and it's a very, very, uh, very well done uh, art piece. And it has a lot of symbolisms here. For example, this uh, the hat, of course. This tree with this thing here, which is a flower, but not, but it's a bird, but not, but it's our, uh, leaves and, and are not leaves. I mean, we were, we were talking, the, the teacher and I we were talking about uh, the kind of tree it is. Uh, maybe it was an oak. We, we didn't know it, but it was, uh, we were trying to find out what tree is it. Now here we have another, another very important expression of the Mexican uh, pre-Hispanic art. In this case, for example, you can find the snake. Here is the, the, the snake and the head inside. As you remember, maybe you have been looking at uh, some uh, Mexican warriors in the Aztecs, and they use, for example, the heads of the tigers, of the jaguares, and they use it as a as a helmet, so they put the head inside. And also, they did a lot of helmets with, a, with a somorphican forms. In this case, we have this very, very uh, simple drawing, but the rest of the snake is eating this personage, or this personage is using the snake for to be protected. And we have, again, here in this case, as a tattoo, the snake in the, this, this uh, form when the snake is uh, rolled in, in herself. 
a lot of bones around that represent the dead. Here, this photo is a collage, of course. This photo with a lot of people here and also here. As you can see, there's a lot of people from many places. This is an oriental person. This is a very Mexican person here around. And these are uh, like uh, people from the U.S. I mean, it's uh, a bunch of people around screaming and, thing, and, and making this, uh, this uh, group, which is very, very intense, and that's why she recovers this. As you can see, the diptych is not related visually, but it's related conceptually. Here, once again, we go through the graffitis. And the graffitis, as a, as a stencil, when you can cut papers, and you can find out this skeleton, for example, in different uh, situations. Here's one again. This uh, personage, you can find it again here. Oh, where is it? Well, this one is also repeated here. Here. One here and one over here. Because they do, what they do is a lot of uh, stencils and uh, they go through the streets in the nights, for example, and uh, because it, for to the police don't catch them, they put the stencils in the wall, they take a, a fast spray to them, they take away the stencil and they run out. And suddenly the city, at the next day, Oaxaca, appears full of uh, these paintings, and all of them are the same one because they had a stencil, these papers uh, cut it, and they have the same painting in many, many places, and the police goes crazy because they didn't catch them, and they have to begin painting it against all the walls. And, but it's a, it's a very, very interesting way to go inside uh, the, 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 the real life of the painters. They are not only in their studios, they are also in, their, in the streets. Uh, this is uh, Jose, Jose Villalobos, which is a very decorative uh, art piece, very correct, of course, but very... very and uh, here, this is part of the video that maybe you saw it from uh, Demian Flores with the wrestlers. Uh, I, I suggest you to see it completely. It's a very interesting one. It's a mise en scene. Of course, it's not the real fighters, but it's the way that uh, Demian Flores supposedly goes. Uh, this Demian Flores is a key person in this new generation. As I was telling uh, a while ago, in two, 2006, uh, there were a lot of problems in the city of Oaxaca because the union of teachers, the section 22 of this union, was fighting a lot because of the, they needed more uh, salary, they didn't want to work uh, more hours, uh, I mean, a lot of very complicated things. And it was, was incredible that uh, this, these fights generated a new generation of creators. Uh, in my personal opinion, they were very wrong in what they were asking, and at the same time, the state in that moment, the governor, go, govern, government of Oaxaca, was doing terrible things at the same time. And then were these two forces fighting against each other, both of, both of them very violent, both of them very uh, full of egos because uh, I am the power and then I am the teacher and the, I am the union. Yes, but I am the governor. And I mean, that was a, was an, it was an, a, not a nice fight. And it was very sad because that ended in, uh, in nothing. That ended in uh, everybody was angry with everybody and there was not a, a possibility of negotiation. But at the same time, this movement in Oaxaca generated a new generation of guys, of, of very, very young people, that was in the activism in the streets. And so they were doing graffitis, they were doing stencils, they were throwing stunts, and then in two, 2006, Demian Flores began to pick up all these very young people and brought them to a place that he created for that, that was called it La Curtiduría. <clears throat> La Curtiduría is a place where the leather is worked in Oaxaca, and it's, um, it was a very important place in, the, in that point, but uh, as, a, as a leather place. 
but uh, was not in use anymore, and he created there in the Curtiduría, he created a school for all these people. And then he began to uh, teach this very young artist to be in the activism, but not in the violence, to be in the activism, but from the art platform. And he generated a very, very interesting uh, group of persons that now, in this point, are, are important creators in Oaxaca. He began now, he created a school also inside, and now there is the third generation, it's very, very near, 2006 is very near, and now is in the street the third generation of these people that began, began doing a very violent uh, things in, in the city of Oaxaca, and now Demian Flores began picking up them, and okay, do you want to express yourself? Okay, come here, let's, let's do engraving, let's do paintings, let's do graffiti, let's do actions in the streets, but let's do it not from the, from the platform of the violence, let's do it from the platform of the art, let's do it from the platform of the confrontation from the ideas, not the confrontation of the force. And what's, what's very important, that's why is the, the, the video of Demian Flores here is a, is a key uh, artwork because he has been very, very concerned about uh, what is going on in these uh, young generations in, in Oaxaca. I think he's one of the most uh, important persons right now. Uh, as Francisco Toledo, <coughs> the, the painting we have here, he began many, many years ago helping a lot his city and his state, helping the church, helping uh, creating the, the Institute of Graphic Arts, creating El Pochote, which is a place where they, they were exhibiting uh, movies without any cost for anybody or, or paying anything. Uh, he created a very uh, important uh, library, and he's helping a lot of persons in Oaxaca. Now, the next generation were two persons. One is uh, Alejandro Santiago, that unfortunately he passed away three months ago, as I was telling you. And the next one, the other one, is Demian Flores. They are both Oaxacan painters, very concerned about what is going on in their states, but not only concerned about their artwork, that is very powerful indeed, but, but uh, they are also concerned about the environment of creators that they are sure are gonna be the next generation. Uh, in my opinion, when I see this uh, collection of artworks from one state, like Oaxaca in this case, uh, I cannot avoid thinking that many other states of Mexico don't have this so powerful way of seeing, way of telling with the paintings what is going on, not only in the matters, that what's going on also in the state that in, and in the places that are being surrounded by them. Uh, I think this exhibition is very, very important because uh, it's not only an exhibition trying a theme, the landscape, the person, the urban, the sky, whatever. It's, a, it's an exhibition, as you can see, in, in, that goes in a many, many different directions, but that let us know a little bit of a very, very uh, powerful environment that is going on in this moment in Oaxaca. Uh, I should like to, if you have some questions and if I can be able to answer them, I should like to have a communication directly with you. One at a time. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, I only want to say thank you for all of you for being here, for your patience and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santiago, for that very enlightening talk. Um, actually, it is really a rare opportunity to have Mexican art in Singapore. In all my years as an artist in Singapore, 
I think this is the first art exhibition on Mexican art. Um, and thank you, Mr. Santiago, for coming to enlighten us uh, with some uh, inside information um, of Mexican art. Thank you very much. And <laughs> And uh, thank you, the Embassy of Mexico and Beatrice, for um, you know giving us this opportunity to show this uh, work in NIE. Uh, this show will also be traveling to Indonesia and Korea, and uh, the ambassador and his wife, who have just left, um, thank you for uh, gracing the event. Now. I'd like to thank you all as well for coming. And there's a little snack for you. It's from one of the best Mexican restaurants in Singapore. And as Singaporeans, I think we do really appreciate that.